Um, my, as I said, my name is Peter. I work for Leo Learning as a solutions architect. Um, however, I come from a software background of big data and using big data to measure impact of something happening. So my background is actually in, in medical software and, and part of that. But what I want to talk about today are some practical steps for how you can begin to measure the actual impact of your learning in Moodle. And I'm also going to talk through some other bits around just some tools you can use and the value of actually doing that. So why measure the effectiveness of your learning? There's a Edward Demings, a great statistician, said, in God we trust, all others must bring data. And uh, Arthur Conan Doyle said, I never guess. It is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. One begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. Because if you don't measure the impact of your learning, you are at best kind of bumbling along, surviving by guessing what works for your students. At worst, you're using your inbuilt bias to force learning upon them that may not be right for them. So what is the value of actually doing it? Real world value, apart from what I've just said there. But this is a slightly kind of business focused one, but I know some of your academics and you hate to think about being business focused, but at the end of the day, your universities are still a business. So the value of measuring the impact of learning is you can prove your return on investment. You can prove the effectiveness of what you're doing as a department. You can see where to target learning. You can see where people are failing or where things aren't working for people and effectively target there, which means you can then prove what works and have more effective learning programs. And I guess the holy grail that we see at Leo, especially for measuring learning impact, is to allow for learning personalization, to allow for true personalization of this person has worked best in these ways, therefore, I'm going to automatically suggest these assets or these things, similar to what Amazon would do for you with your products. I mean, I, it, it works quite well. I mean, if it works 70% of the time, it works. There are some of you in here, though, that probably have objections towards learning analytics, and there are three big ones, really, that we probably need to... I, I like to cover because they come up quite a lot even in the kind of business spaces where we work, rather than just the HE space. Now, the first one is that a lot of the challenges over the past few years from academia have come through of saying that any measurement of learning analytics is not scientific. It's not a valid experiment. You can't control the variables. You can't go in and say that... I definitely did this. So I'm going to go back to my business argument. I mean, how many business decisions do you think are made based on true double-blind or even good experimental data? It's probably zero. All decisions made are based on slightly flawed data. Now, there's some other things on that that it might not be scientific, but you don't need it to be scientific really around. There's a great um, story one of our um, director of learning uses around um, Martha Stewart. Martha Stewart was not convicted by scientifically valid experimental data. She was convicted by a chain of evidence that was good enough to convict her and put her in court for a long time. And if that's good enough for that, it should be good enough for us. Secondly, it's too hard. It is quite hard, I'll give you that. Um, all I can say to this is if you get the right people involved and the right tools involved, it becomes easy. Making a car is hard. I doubt anyone in this room has made a car. You go to the garage, you go to somebody who's built the car, you buy one off the shelf. Someone has designed it, somebody has bought, created the tools to do it. They've hired and managed the workforce to build it. They've got the supply chain to deliver it to you. Well, why should learning analytics be any different? And thirdly, it's too expensive. Again, it's a, it's a fair point, but towards the end, I'm actually gonna point out some tools that we've used inside Leo that are either cheap or quite a lot of them are actually free open source tools. So we in Leo utilize a model. This is a model actually developed by a guy called Mike Rustasy, who is the guy who, um, Rustasy Software, SCORM.com, the actual guy who was one of the main drivers on the XAPI specification. And he now runs a learning analytics company actually called Watershed that Mark was mentioning earlier on. And these seven steps work quite well in being able just to simply break down how to get started on this. So first of all, work out what you want to do. A lot of the things we've been presenting so far and we've heard about are big kind of machine learning analytics tools that probably, as people have said, there's not, they might not have enough data for it, but also you probably don't want to start there necessarily. 
start small, maybe consider running just an A-B test between two courses. Have two cohorts do the same learning, but through three, two different courses. Um, or even, you can do it using the big data approach, just fire all the data at it and see where you can see correlations. But the key thing we also say with this as well is you've got to, it's no good just measuring your learning and dropouts, things like that. My topic was, one of the topics I was given was measuring the real world impact. You've got to work out what are, in business we call them the KPIs. What are the KPIs you're trying to teach your people? You're trying to make them more efficient, sell more doodads, build more what's it. Are you trying to make them stop leaving their laptop on the bus? Are you trying to think of that? And I think in academia, we, we, we don't necessarily measure that. We measure it by thought retention and by thinking and not by actually saying, well, let's, let's look for a real world thing or something that we can truly measure. Secondly, when you want to do this, you've got to get buy-in from your business, and it's no good just getting buy-in from your learning team or anyone else. You need buy-in from the top, you need buy-in from the bottom. If you're tracking data out people, people get fearful. People get fearful that you're going to use it as a stick, not as a carrot. They're going to get fearful that you're going to use it to kick them out, you're going to use it to penalise them. Whereas in reality, you're doing this because you want to improve the efficacy of your learning. And that's what you've got to communicate at all levels of the business. It also helps later, which we'll talk about some more when you need to actually get the data. Thirdly, I would suggest you design an experiment. As I said, an A-B approach, work out what you want to compare. It's, as I said, it's no good having the learning data in isolation. You've got to have something that you can measure, really, something quantifiable you can go and measure if you want to prove the impact of your learning. Um, as I said, if you're, using the, if you're using either method, you can, you can do lots of things. I'm not going to get into learning, but we did a big one that Mark mentioned recently with our partners at Watershed with the CPR model. They were literally saying, OK, our experiment is we're going to put people through two different kind of methods of the course. People will do face-to-face. -face. These people will have the app and the face-to-face -face, and then work out who, who actually performed better. And they, they simply found out that one of the methods was 30% more effective. So they can then focus their learning on that one method Sorry, focus their, yeah, their learning is the one method. Fourthly, get the data. This is one of the hard ones. This is why XAPI and Caliper and other things are important. It's, it, it's, we need to have portable data between these systems. We need to have interfaces. We need to have ways of getting that data between. One thing I was just in this is, is certainly get expertise in this. There are people out there, and I know Mark mentioned Andrew Downs earlier on, but his role is simply called, the, we call him the interoperability consultant. He makes data talk in XAPI format. Get people who can get that data for you into Caliper, into XAPI, so that you can actually compare it. Now, with the data as well, I wouldn't just suggest that you just get kind of pass-fail data. Mark mentioned as well earlier on, Natasha, the Logstore plugin. It's quite an interesting tool to use. We use it quite a lot with some of our learning experiments. Not because we can necessarily get provable insights out of it, but just so we can get minor things. I mean, there was, an, there was a good example whereby we saw using the Logstore plugin that people were failing on one specific e-learning file. And it turned out that e-learning file had a bug in it that we didn't recognise. It got through testing, got through everything else, was in production. And this client had worked out, actually, this, this has a major bug that means nobody can pass this. And they found out about that a lot quicker by getting that kind of surrounding data than they probably would have done because, unfortunately, they were doctors and people just stopped doing the learning and went, I can't be bothered with this anymore. Fifthly, measure your impact. Go with your hypothesis. Try and, t try and disprove it. Do an experiment. Go and actually say, did we sell more doodads? Did we have less complaints? Have more passes? Did, we, did our net promoter score go up? Did our dropout rates go down? Now, somebody tweeted earlier on that correlation doesn't equal causation. I would argue it's a good place to start. It's a statistics thing I was taught at university that, no, it doesn't, but often it's a good place to actually go and look at and start looking at why is that happening. Now, you may just find that it's just rubbish. Quite often you do, but sometimes you may well find actionable insights out of that. Number six, you've then got to communicate your findings. And there's been a lot of chat about this over the past few days. And earlier on, people were saying, is it ethical to hold this data but not communicate it? I would argue probably it isn't ethical to not communicate it, but you need to carefully choose your communication method. It's no good giving the CEO. L and D are, are terrible at giving the CEO or the learning department, whoever you want to call yourself, are terrible at giving the CEO this massive spreadsheet with all the learning data in a few graphs. When marketing or sales go to their kind of meetings, that kind of thing, they bring their one piece of data. They bring their one 
great thing that they've done, their one big thing they want to shout about, and they shout about that. We need to do the same. We need to show that the methods we've used or the experiments we've done or the money we've spent has done this thing. Be, be whatever it is. And communicating down as well, do you think everyone needs access to a dashboard? Probably not. Uh, some of those basic dashboards that I on look great. They were simple kind of, this is your risk status or this is where your score is coming in or this is this. So be careful to design your communication of those findings. And number seven, use those findings to improve what you do. We as humans are trying to, that's the whole wealth of knowledge is designed to improve ourselves. Now, if you're measuring something and you're not using those measurements to improve what you do, why? Why are you bothering to measure in the first place? This is the whole point of it. You want to do better. You want to do better for the people that are paying a lot of money for your learning to do it. So actually use that. Now, how you do that is, a, is, a, is an in, uh, interesting manner. It really depends what you, what you find out. You may find out, unfortunately, that a lot of stuff you've been doing is, is not working and suddenly you have to throw out a lot of things. And some people in, in the corporate world would say, actually, we, you found out we have this, this flaw in our training and we're liable for this and that's a big problem. Well, it is a big problem because your people haven't learned. Don't panic about this kind of stuff, though, as well. There are plenty of people out there that can help you out with this. They'll give you free information, other things, or just companies you can go to. When marketing started doing analytics, they didn't do it on their own. They got help in from other companies, from people who, experts, who had data scientists, and they've slowly learnt and they've slowly built this up as part of their kind of their, their skills. Now, CIPD have actually put um, analytics into their program recently. So this year, there is now a five-week module on analytics. So we're beginning to do that. But if you don't have the knowledge or the expertise, go and get help. Now, I promised I'd help you out with some kind of practical tools around kind of how we start to build up almost this learning ecosystem that can track those, those um, that learning analytics. Now, there's some great things up there. Some of these are slightly business focused, as I said, but all of these, we at LTG or Leo would classify as a decent XAPI activity provider. Things like Learning Locker, that's a free LRS, can run that. We scaled that pretty well already. Um, things like XAPI apps, it's a company out of Australia that lets you build little performance support apps that run on your phone. It'll just send a statement back to the LRS and say, I saw this person doing this good thing here. A lot of the authoring tools, things like Kaltura, if you've got that as a video platform, yeah, you can get great XAPI analytics out of Kaltura already. And as Sasha mentioned, there's things like Watershed and Yet that are probably slightly wrong for you guys. They're what we call kind of human capital management tools, but they could easily be used in that way. Just to sum up, here's my three biggies from the beginning there. The reason you need to measure the real world impact of your learning is because you get the better outcomes for your learners. Your organization has a better outcome because your learners say, this is great learning. We want to do this. We want to carry on. It's good PR for you. And lastly, you get better justification of your budgets. If you can empirically prove what you're doing works, then you can get more money. Trust me, we've done it a lot recently. Yeah, I can't see. No worries. Yeah.